Good morning and welcome to worship here at Richmond Presbyterian Church. I'm Victor Kim, the lead minister, and I want to welcome you wherever you may be as you're watching us, maybe on YouTube, maybe on Facebook. Friends, it's good to be together with you as we worship God. Uh, members of the congregation are also invited to join us for a virtual fellowship time, our Munch and Mingle, at the end of our service, and you have that Zoom invitation in your emails. You can also go on the website, www.richprez.com, and you'll also find the invitation there as well. Just want to wish everyone a happy Father's Day as we gather this morning. Um, I want to take a moment now to thank everyone for their ongoing financial support of the ministry here at RPC. Um, again, check our website for various ways in which you can financially support the ministry. If you subscribe to These Days magazine, you can pick up a copy of that magazine. It'll have your name on it. And they're just outside the front doors of the church, so you don't have to actually come in the church, but just come by later on and pick up your copy. We want to congratulate our friend, the Reverend Dr. Ray Aldred, uh, on his recent appointment as interim dean at Vancouver School of Theology, and we wish him well in this important work. And we want to take a moment to recognize that June 21st is National Indigenous Peoples Day. And this is a day that we recognize and celebrate the unique heritage, diverse cultures, and outstanding contributions of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Friends, there are a lot of other announcements. Uh, check the website. Just uh, give the church a call if you have any questions. Um, again, it's just good to be with you virtually, and we look forward to that day when we can be together again in person. Friends, come. Now is the time to worship. join with me in the call to worship. Gladden the souls of your servants, O God. To you, O Lord, we lift up our hearts. The Lord is good and forgiving, abounding on steadfast love. Listen to our cries, O God, and answer. God is great and does wondrous things. So we come to worship and bow down before you, O Lord. Let us glorify God's name together. Friends, our praise song is How He Loves, so let us praise God together. Oh, 
Would you join with me in prayer? Let's pray. God of grace, you created our minds to grow in wisdom. You created our hearts to expand with love for you and your world. You created our voices to sing your praises forever. Fill us to overflowing with your Holy Spirit so we may worship you in spirit and in truth, bold and unafraid to follow you in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. God who creates the future, you call us to follow you, and yet we confess that we prefer to remain where we are. You offer us new beginnings, and yet we continue to make the same familiar choices. You invite us into the fullness of life, and yet we distance ourselves from you and each other through fear and doubt. Forgive us, O God. Cleanse us from every unworthy thought, word, and deed with the grace of Christ our Lord. Rouse us by the Spirit to be intentional, courageous disciples, even when the world does not welcome us or the word that we proclaim in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Hear the good news. In Christ, we are made a new creation. Our old life is gone, and a new life has come. Know that God loves you and forgives you, and don't be afraid to make a new start. Thanks be to God. Friends, as we have been reconciled to God through our Lord Jesus Christ and the peace that he offers, let us also share that peace with one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Friends, Let's continue in our worship. Our hymn is the hymn for the beauty of the earth. Welcome to our time with young Christians. Today I have a beautiful book to share with you. It's called God's Dream. This book is written by Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Douglas Carlton Abrams. It's illustrated by Lei Win Pham and it's published by Candlewick Press and shared with their permission. I've also added a few illustrations from the Honor Drum by Cheryl and Tim Huff 
share a beer and Tim Huff, and I've added some photos from the internet. And in honor of Father's Day and Indigenous Peoples Day, I dedicate this reading to all dads everywhere, and especially to Indigenous dads. Dear child of God, what do you dream about in your loveliest of dreams? Do you dream about flying high or rainbows reaching across the sky? Do you dream about being free to do what your heart desires? Or about being treated like a full person, no matter how young you might be? Do you know what God dreams about? If you close your eyes and look with your heart, I am sure, dear child, that you will find out. God dreams about people sharing. God dreams about people caring. God dreams that we play one another's games and laugh with one another's hearts. God dreams that we are friends with one another and that we learn from one another. But God does not force us to be friends or to love one another. Dear child of God, it does happen that sometimes we get angry and that sometimes we hurt one another. Soon we start to feel sad and so very alone. Sometimes we cry and God cries with us. But when we say we're sorry and forgive one another, we wipe away our tears and God's tears too. Each of us carries a piece of God's heart within us. And when we love one another, the pieces of God's heart are made whole. God dreams that every one of us will see that we are all brothers and sisters. Even if we have different mummies and daddies or live in different far away lands. even if we speak different languages or have different ways of talking to God, even if we have different eyes or different skin. Dear child of God, do you know how to make God's dream come true? It's really quite easy. As easy as playing and laughing and sharing loving and caring. Although some of the ways in which we show our love and care have had to be somewhat different over the last few months. We've had to stay apart more than we used to. We've had to find creative ways to show our love and care for others. We've even had to wear masks in certain contexts. Making God's dream come true is as easy as knowing we are family because we are all God's children. We are all God's children. Children, parents, grandparents, single people, Friends, will you help God's dream come true? Let me tell you a secret. God smiles like a rainbow when you do.
Let's pray. God of wisdom, by the power of your Holy Spirit, open our minds to your truth, our hearts to your gospel, and our hands so that we can do your will. In the name of Jesus, your living word, we pray. Amen. The scripture reading for this morning is taken from Genesis 48, verses 8 through 21. When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, Who are these? Joseph said to his father, They are my sons, whom God has given me here. And he said, Bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age, and he could not see well. So Joseph brought them near him, and he kissed them and embraced them. Israel said to Joseph, I did not expect to see your face. And here God has let me see your children also. Then Joseph removed them from his father's knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand towards Israel's left, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right, and brought them near him. But Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, crossing his hands, for Manasseh was the firstborn. He blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my ancestors Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all harm, bless the boys, and in them let my name be perpetuated. And the name of my ancestors Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude on the earth. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. So he took his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father. Since this one is the firstborn, put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his offspring shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will invoke blessings, saying, God made you like Ephraim and like Manasseh. So he put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, I am about to die. But God will be with you and will bring you again to the land of your ancestors. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. 
to all the dads and granddads out there, happy Father's Day. Everyone, this is Alex uh, from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Uh, to all fathers, happy Father's Day. Uh, take care and stay safe. Bye. Wishing all fathers happy Father's Day from Jakarta, Indonesia. Happy Father's Day. Wishing everybody a happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Hey, to all dads, happy Father's Day. We know you do a lot and we so appreciate it. And uh, have an amazing day. Happy Father's Day. I want to thank Jenny and the RPC Choir for that beautiful anthem. Uh, the still photos that you see on the video are of Janet Norris's family in Ottawa, and we thank them for helping us to sing this morning. I want to thank Mike Casey for our scripture reading and also those who have sent Father's Day wishes, including family of our new administrative assistant, Maureen, and they are sending their wishes from Malaysia and Indonesia. Clearly, our, our, our reach in this, in this um, internet age is quite worldwide, and we're excited about that. Friends, today is Father's Day, in case you didn't know. And there are more people than you might think who don't always know. You know, Father's Day isn't like Mother's Day, which no one forgets. You don't want to compare Father's Day with Mother's Day because Mother's Day wins hands down. You know, in terms of effort made and economic impact, Mother's Day clearly outshines Father's Day. I'm not really sure why that is, but over the years, Mother's Day has certainly become far more commercially attractive than Father's Day. So the retailers and our, our media really, really play it up. You know, flowers and chocolate for Mother's Day, jewelry, just an overall sense of tenderness and appreciation. But for dad, well, it's often a bit more casual, isn't it? Another tacky tie, or for those truly lucky dads, a box of golf balls, which is always a welcome gift. Are you listening, my children? You know, even church attendance favors Mother's Day. Mother's Day is one of the most highly attended church services of the year, and Father's Day is one of the lowest attended church services. Now, it's probably because by the time we get to Father's Day, school is usually out and it's, it's summer. But still, but still. You know, in my family, we have tried always to remember Mother's Day and make a big deal out of it. Back when I was living in Calgary, my entire family would always make a big effort for Mother's Day. But for Father's Day, well, if my brother and I were able to get out, take my dad out for a round of golf, well, that was a big deal. And if we didn't, well, no big deal. My dad never made a big deal out of it, and I suppose I don't either. Not a big deal. But you know what? Fathers are a big deal. Fathers are a big deal. And the need for good fathers is no joking matter. You know, it's not always easy to find role models for good fathers in our culture, in our media. In an ironic twist, some years ago, the Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright, Jr., who used to be the senior pastor of Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago, it's the church that President Obama used to attend, um, Wright quoted Bill Cosby on the issue of the difficulty of finding positive male role models for young African-American boys. We keep looking in the wrong place, said Cosby. And I'm sure Wright couldn't have imagined that years later, the same Bill Cosby, who would come to be known as America's dad through the sitcom The Cosby Show, would be found guilty of drugging women and sexually assaulting them. We do keep on looking in the wrong places indeed, don't we? You know, maybe, maybe we should be looking closer to home. While our culture may not have an abundance of positive male father figures, you know, many of us grew up in homes that did. I certainly did. My father was the oldest of eight children, one of whom didn't survive during childhood. You know, at the end of the Second World War, my father's family was left penniless as Korea regained its independence from Japan. And not too long after that, his father, my grandfather, died leaving my father as the main breadwinner in his family. So my father had to stop his schooling 
and he had to go to work. And that allowed for his three younger brothers, my uncles, to keep attending school. The oldest of my uncles attended law school in Korea, and then when he immigrated to Canada, he became, uh, he became a draftsman. My second uncle became an accountant, and he worked for Shell Oil. And my youngest uncle is a professor of business, and currently he teaches at St. Mary's University in Halifax. All of my uncles would tell you, however, that of the four brothers, they always felt that my father was the smartest of the bunch. But you know what? He never got the education or the opportunities that they did. Later on, he moved his family to Canada with no English and no job. And he, along with my mother, put their two sons through school. My father became the first elder ordained at the newly formed Calgary Korean Presbyterian Church. As far as I know, he never read any books on parenting, but he knew instinctively not to let me go to bed mad. And if he had to punish me or discipline me for, ever, for anything, he would always take the time to speak with me after so that I wasn't angry and left with no explanation. And culturally, as a Korean man of a certain era, saying the words, I love you, to his son wasn't something that was easy for him, but I never doubted that he did. I never doubted that he did. He turns 85 this week, and so I want to say to him, Dad, happy Father's Day. There's another father that I want to speak about this morning, and that's Joseph from our text from which Mike read from Genesis 48. You know, by the time we get to this part of the book of Genesis, a lot has happened in Joseph's life. The Joseph who brings his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, to be blessed by his father Jacob is nothing like the young, naive boy who went around telling his older brothers about his dreams, his dreams of them bowing down to him. Nothing like that, that naive boy who used to walk around in his coat of many colors in front of his brothers, just showing off how much he was his father's favorite. I mean, how stupid do you have to be to get your brothers to hate you so much that they would consider murdering you, but in the end settling for just selling you off into slavery and telling their father that you had been eaten by wild animals. But as I said, there's a lot that's happened between that Joseph and the one that's represented in our text this morning. Reverend Wright breaks down what makes a good father and why Joseph is a model of a good father. So I want to share those, those qualities with you. A good father puts God first. A good father puts God first. Think what you will of the young Joseph, but he always put God first. You know, he told his dreams to his brothers because they were dreams from God. When he was a slave in Egypt, his master's wife tried to seduce him. Joseph resisted her and told her that he could never do such a great evil against God. Whether as a slave in Potiphar's house or whether as second in command over all of Egypt, Joseph never forgot who he was and whose he was. Later in life, Joseph named his own sons Manasseh and Ephraim, which means God made me forget my sufferings and God has given me children in the land of my trouble. In all things, God was always first in Joseph's life. In all, thing, God, in all things, God was always first. A good father, though, also seeks God's guidance. Right? A good father also seeks God's guidance. Throughout his life, Joseph sought God's guidance. Again, whether as a slave in Potiphar's house, whether in jail after being falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, whether before Pharaoh or before his own brothers, when Joseph was in a position of power over them, he sought the guidance of God. He sought the guidance of God. Jeremiah Wright says this about his own father, who came from the tobacco fields of Virginia to hold a municipal board seat on the city of Philadelphia. He earned four degrees, three of them in theology. And Wright says, his father never got so educated that he stopped seeking God's guidance. I love that. He never got so educated 
that he stop seeking God's guidance. A good father seeks God's guidance. I know that from the day that I was born, my father never stopped seeking God's guidance about how to be a good father, how to raise his children. And I know that to this day, he prays for me each day so that I might be a good father to my own children. You know, we can't forget that we too have a father, a good father who loves us. And it is God's guidance that must inform and equip and nourish us in all of the decisions, in all of the decisions that we face in life. A good father asks for God's blessings. A good father asks for God's blessings. Joseph brings his children to his father, Jacob, now called Israel, so that his father can bless Manasseh and Ephraim. In those days, it was this patriarchal blessing through which God's blessing was passed from generation to generation. Remember when Jacob stole, well, remember when Jacob himself stole the blessing of his father Isaac from his brother Esau, from his older brother Esau, that left Esau in tears, unable to receive the blessing that Isaac had unwittingly given to Jacob? I remember an elder from my previous congregation who told me that each morning as his children left for school, each morning as, he, as they left for school, he would ask God to bless them that, and that God would bless them and bring them home safely. When my children were younger, each night as they got ready for bed, I would pronounce the ironic blessing on them. Right? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Every night I would pronounce that blessing. I would seek God's blessing upon my children. Fathers and mothers, we need to pray for God's blessing on our children. We believe in a God who desires to bless us. We believe in a God who desires to bless us. We should not take that for granted. We should not take that for granted. A good father puts the past behind him. A good father puts the past behind him. As I said earlier, Joseph the man at the end of Genesis is not the same Joseph the boy who was his father's favorite. He's made mistakes, he's made mistakes. But Joseph is a different brother at the end than he was at the beginning. As the second in command over all of Egypt, when his brothers came to him begging for grain, Joseph, who was unrecognized by his brothers, he could have exacted re revenge, right? He could have exacted revenge. But in the end, Joseph shows mercy, compassion. He's overcome by love for his brothers. How do you love those who sold you into slavery? How do you love those who abandoned you, who left you basically for dead? But Joseph, who put God first, who sought God's, God's guidance, who asked for God's blessings, also knows that while his brothers may have meant evil for him, God churned that evil into good. God churned that evil into good. He left that. He left the past behind him. He left the past behind him. How many fathers do we know who have modeled instead an unwillingness to forgive and move on from the past and thus have equipped future generations who have equipped another generation to hold on to old grudges, ancient grievances, and unsettled scores? But a good father who puts God first, who seeks God's guidance, who asks for God's blessings, also knows to put the past behind him, to forgive and to embrace the possibilities of the future that God provides. You know, it, it could not have been easy for my father to leave all that he knew behind and immigrate to Canada, his friends, his culture, his home. And yet, it was an opportunity at a new life it did cost him all that he had known to that point in his life. But over all the years that I've known my father, I've never heard him speak a word of regret. I've never heard him speak a word of regret about making that decision. 
I hope I learn the same lessons. And ultimately, good fathers put their trust in the Lord. Good fathers put their trust in the Lord. How tempting it must have been for Joseph to turn away from God. You know, while he was in that pit, as his brothers debated about his future, whether to kill him, when he was sold off into slavery in Egypt, when he was jailed under false pretenses, you know, when that chief cupbearer who he helped to interpret his dreams for him, when he said that once he got released, he would remember Joseph and then Plum forgot about him completely, he could have lost his faith. Joseph could have lost his faith. He could have wondered, where is God in all of my suffering? Still, never, still Joseph never gave up, and he trusted, he trusted in the Lord. He remained faithful. You know, studies have shown that in households where the father goes to church, where the father is faithful, the likelihood of a child remaining a churchgoer later on in life is dramatically higher than in homes where the father doesn't attend, even if the mother does. Good fathers, good fathers trust in God. Good fathers trust in God even in times when life is difficult or unpredictable. The way a good father models that trust, the way a good father models that trust in faithful participation in the body of Christ with the people of God makes a huge impact on their children and on their families. Joseph brings his children to his father Jacob for a blessing. Joseph knows the power of trusting in God. He knows that his own children will see his faith, his trust in God, that they will be impacted and nourished by what they see in their father. You know, the text this morning presents a tender and powerful scene. Three generations participating in a ritual of blessing that seeks to trust in the Lord, to ask for God's guidance and God's blessings, to put God first. Jacob, named Israel, his son Joseph, the child of Jacob's first love, Rachel, and Joseph's own sons, Ephraim and Manasseh who will later become part of the 12 tribes of Israel, all of them together in this text, bearing witness to walking faithfully with God. You know, for fathers today, the faithful walking with God, this faithful walking with God is so critical, not only for us as fathers, but also for those who will follow in our footsteps, who will follow in our footsteps. Wright tells the story of the Chicago blizzard of 1979 when a man's car spun out of control in the snow and got stuck in the side of the road. The snow drifts were way too high for his eight-year-old son to walk in, so the father told the son to stay in the car until he came back with help. The father kept the car running so that his son would be warm, and he cracked the windows open so that, he, that his son wouldn't suffer from carbon monoxide poisoning. And the father walked for three miles before he came to the Great Lakes Naval Station. But by that time, the storm had grown so fierce that there was absolutely no way for him to get back to his son. The roads had not only become impassable, but they had become impossible. No one could tell where the field stopped and where the roads began. It would have taken days to get back to his car. And the snow drifts grew to be 20 feet high. When it dawned on the father that it would, be, it would be impossible for him to return to his son, he had to be physically restrained from going back out into that blizzard, which would have surely taken his own life. But in his struggle to get free, the father heard his son's voice coming from the room next door in the warming center. And in, in, in disbelief, he ran over to that room, and there was his son laughing and playing with the other children and some of the soldiers, some of the sailors. Incredulous, the father said, son, how did you get here? I thought you were still in the car. It was easy, daddy, said the son. I was afraid to stay where you left me, so I waited until you were out of sight, and then I followed 
walking in your footsteps. To my fellow fathers, you know, someone is watching where we're walking, right? Someone is watching where we're walking, how we're walking, and whether our talk mirrors, matches our walk, right? Whether our, our walk matches our talk. The good news for fathers is that we have good, we have good role models to follow ourselves. Many of us have or have had good fathers for whom we ought to be always grateful to God. We have the faithful witness in Scripture of good fathers like Joseph. And of course, we have our own good, good father who is perfect in all of his ways and who loves us completely. So friends, may we as fathers and may we as mothers as daughters and as sons, old and young, put our God first and trust in God always. And may we know the blessing of God upon all of our lives. God bless you and be with you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, our response to God's word to us is the praise song, Good, Good Father. So let us praise God together.
please join me in prayer. God of compassion and courage, in our weakness, you are strength. In our darkness, you are light. In our sorrows, you are comfort and peace. Embrace each situation we remember in our prayers this day with your steadfast love. We thank you for moments of joy that still break into our lives, even in these strange times. For love given and received. For friends who furnish our life with meaning and happiness. And for family who embrace us with love and understanding. We thank you for all caring and faithful fathers celebrated this day, remembering also those whose fathers have died and praying for those fathers cut off from their families. God of the nations, we pray for our country and countries around this world so deeply affected by COVID-19. Guide leaders to make wise decisions about reopening communities and give patience and courage to those whose lives have been disrupted, especially those who fear what the future holds. Wherever injustice rules and misinformation confuses, protect the vulnerable and shine the light of your truth to reveal the path to justice and renewed hope. God of compassion, we pray for peace to prevail in places torn by war. We ask that respect for human life will grow wherever people are abused or scorned. We pray for all those who are suffering and for all who mourn significant loss. Surround them with your love. Support them with the strength of your spirit. Open our eyes to see how we might bring comfort to those who are hurting. Eternal God, you hold the dead as well as the living in your tender care. We thank you for your people in every age who have entered into your presence, especially those dear to our own hearts. Keep us in communion with them and bring us to dwell with them at the last in your everlasting light. Hear us as we offer prayers in silence for the concerns on our hearts this day. And now we pray together with the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The closing hymn is Great is Thy Faithfulness.
sisters and brothers, go into God's world as fathers, as mothers, as sons and daughters, keeping God first in your lives, seeking God's guidance always, asking for and being conduits of God's blessing, putting the past behind you and looking forward to the future that God intends for you, and always putting your trust in God's love, God's care. Go to model what it means to be a faithful follower of Jesus so that others may follow in our footsteps. And the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, remain, and abide with each of you and with all those whom you love, both this day and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.